Here is an email from Rick, and I really enjoyed reading this story. This guy's a good writer. He, uh, let's see, he says I can use his name. I've already told you his name is Rick. I've never run into a Bigfoot head on, but indirectly I'm pretty sure that I've had two encounters over the years. I am an old Marine. I'm 80 years old, and I've hunted and camped all my life, from California to Colorado to Kansas and back. I was born in Corpus Christi in the war years. This is about the start of what we call the valley, and I've hunted the Gulf Coast all my life, from white-winged doves on the King Ranch to white-tailed deer in East Texas to the big mule deer in West Texas. When I was younger, I mostly hunted by myself, but occasionally I would gather up my two brothers with me, more for company than hunting. They gave me maybe three chances before they decided that they had had enough. They didn't seem to like hunting in a rainstorm. How was I to know that? And then there was a time I forgot all the groceries. They thought I was trying to starve them to death. And maybe sleeping on the ground under the pickup bed was too much for them. Well, at least I gave them a chance. One year, I was getting ready to hunt. I had a great place I had found. It was out of Goodrich, Texas, off a county road, which intersected with Highway 59. This was before Lake Livingston had been developed, and there was a lot of logging going on. And you could get on one of these roads and ride until you found a place you wanted to hunt, and then set up camp and enjoy the outdoors. On this one night, I was walking back to camp. I had been out all day scouting for rubs and scrapes before the deer season. There was a big moon out and it was lit well and I kept hearing something running in front of me. There was enough light from the moon that I didn't need a flashlight to see my trail so I kept it off until I was parallel with my campsite and when I turned it on there was a little red fox that had been leading the way. I turned into camp and kept going. And about this time, a scream like none I had ever heard before came out of the woods behind my camp. Hunting in these woods all my life, I've pretty much heard every sound that can be made. And I know when a squirrel is fussing at me as they move through the heavy brush to the scream of a bobcat, and this sound didn't belong to anything that I'd ever heard. I couldn't get inside my pickup fast enough. And I started it up, and the lights on bright, I backed up and scanned the woods, but I never saw anything. Not being for sure what was out there, that night was spent inside the truck without any supper. The next morning, I got up and fixed some coffee and breakfast, and I went back out scouting again, waiting for one of my little brothers and his new wife to show up. Around noon, they showed up, and I helped them get their camp area set up. And after a light lunch, I took them out and showed them some good places to hunt. Later that evening, we had a nice campfire with a good supper, and it was very peaceful, and with a good cup of coffee, we enjoyed each other's company until 9 o'clock when we turned in. I never said anything to them about the sounds I had heard, and I hoped for the best. There were no more screams, but there were a few knocks that night, but they were in the distance, so we had a great two-day hunt with no problems. I often wondered about what I had heard that night, knowing that whatever it was had to move on. But where did it go? My next encounter was at Stubblefield Lake Campgrounds, which is at the north end of Lake Conroe, on Highway 45 and County Road 1375. I always get to the campgrounds a couple of days early to get camp set up and do a little fishing before my son and grandson come up for hunting season. I went out before it got too late one evening to get some firewood. And while I was down the road gathering firewood, that sixth sense clicked in and I sensed something was not right. Something was wrong and I was in danger. So back inside the pickup I went and then I took off. I left half my firewood in the middle of the road. Only twice in my life have I been spooked and these are the two times. Sam Houston National Forest has over 163,000 acres to play in with the Lone Star hiking trail that runs through it, which is over 100 miles, and this is where many sightings have been. So when that sixth sense clicked in, this is all I could think about. It must have been Bigfoot, and it must have been close watching me. 
The next night, I went back to the same place and gathered up my wood, and I had no bad feelings, so whatever had been there was gone. About the most dangerous animal we have in these woods would be a rabid raccoon. I've had a friend that's hunted up there for over 40 years, and he met one while he was out hunting one morning without any problems. This sighting was back in the 1980s, and I've known Ron this many years, and he's never lied to me, and I truly believe every word he said. I know exactly where he was hunting that day, and in February, after hunting season is over, and with the woods clear of guns, I have recruited a team that is going with me to the place where he had his encounter to see if we can find some evidence, or maybe I can get me a card-playing scotch-drinking buddy. According to Ron, when Bigfoot stepped out, he moved a couple of six-inch pine trees to the side. He looked at him and made two light grunts and then turned and walked away. Ron said that he was still sitting on his butt on the ground, leaning up against this big pine tree that he had climbed over when he had slipped down, and he never even unslung his gun to watch the creature walk away. Well, his hunting was through for that day, and realizing what had just happened, he decided to hunt in one of his other places, not wanting that experience ever again. And he says, P.S., this is for you. It can be read if you choose to. Well, I'm going to go ahead and read it. How can a person listen to you and not believe in Bigfoot? Don't, hey, let me stop here. Don't believe in Bigfoot because of me. I am a skeptic. I'm a total skeptic. I'm not saying they don't exist, but I'm not saying they do. Anyway, on to his postscript. I guess I have gotten older and I've gotten braver or maybe not too smart. And that is why I'm going out Bigfoot hunting. I've seen so many people go out looking for Bigfoot, and when they find him, they run away. If he throws a rock, throw one back. And if he growls at you, growl back. And if he screams, you need to scream back. You need to do these things to see what kind of response and reaction you get back. You need to try to understand what he's doing and what you're going after and trying to accomplish, but also protect yourself, just in case things take a turn for the worst. And he writes, thanks again, Rick. Uh, that actually sounds like a guy in the Marine Corps. If he screams at you, scream back. Uh, normally it would be if he screams at you, kill him. I mean, Marine Marines are killers. That's what they're trying to do. Tear stuff up and kill people. This was a great story. I ran across it this morning and I wanted to make sure that you guys heard it. I thought it was interesting. 80-year-old Marine Corps veteran. I appreciate him sending this story to me. Thank you, sir. This writer wants to be anonymous. He even writes, I'd like to be anonymous. I'm an oil truck driver in the state of Connecticut. It's not a popular state for Bigfoot sightings. At least that's what I thought. This experience took place at a campground along Route 80, but I prefer not to say the exact location. I drive a triaxle oil truck, which is quite large, but it's not a tractor trailer. In the fall, our workload increases, and on this day, I had 12 tickets for delivery at the same location. It was a summer camp that was having a Halloween weekend event for kids. I had to fuel the outside, above-ground oil tanks that heated the cabins and the water heaters. I arrived at 6 a.m. on Thursday before the weekend celebrations and I began fueling my first cabin. Without moving the truck, I could drag the hose to three other cabins within reach. In case you aren't familiar with oil delivery, the oil goes in and a vent alarm allows the pushed air out with a whistling sound. Some of these vent alarms were making piercing sounds and some were clogged with bugs or other matter. The driver before me may have overloaded the tanks, and there's oil on top of the vent alarm, and sometimes it makes it gurgle. It's hard to explain, but sometimes it makes the whistle sound sick. I parked the truck and dragged the hose to fuel the farthest of the three cabins first. I always drag to the farthest first to make the next ones easier. I fueled the first tank, and there was nothing unusual, and then as I began fueling the next cabin's tank, I noticed movement in the distance. There wasn't anything in the background except woods and a lake, and after the lake there was nothing but more woods. 
It was two days before the weekend, and I thought it odd that someone would be there so early. The second cabin I delivered the oil to made a funny whistling sound while venting, that gurgling sound. Again, I saw the movement of these three people. Well, I'm alone in the middle of nowhere this early, and I'm thinking, who in the world is fishing? Well, I finished, and I moved to the third oil tank within reach before I went on to fill the next nine tanks on the property. And then I hooked the hose up and started my job again. But I'm still looking toward the lake. The whistle on this one was blaring, and as I was waiting for the tank to fill, a figure moved. It was massive. It was not a person. Holy cow, I thought. And I stopped the delivery to quiet the vent alarm whistle. I didn't move as I watched, and this thing was still walking toward me. I'm telling you, it was enormous, and I was still, and I was panicking. My oil truck is 9 feet 10 inches tall, and this thing was just as tall. It was about 40 yards from me in the truck, but it was close enough for me, and then the two others that were smaller moved, and they were to the right of me. Their movement was slow, and I think they were curious, but I wasn't curious. I was terrified. The good part of this is they were not aggressive. The vent alarms must have intrigued them, but I moved slowly, and then I reeled up the hose and I got the heck out of there. At noon, I went back with a helper to fuel the rest of the cabins. I'm not at shame to admit that I was scared. I have never seen anything on two feet that huge. I can't describe their faces, but I know three creatures on two legs isn't a coincidence. They weren't bears because bears are not that agile or that large. I have fueled the campground since then, but I don't go at 6 a.m. I'll let others open the campground before I get there. Oh, that's a great story. That's not like a in-your-face, you know, real violent, screaming, horrible smells, anything. He's just filling oil tanks, and these this noise is, is piquing the curiosity of these Bigfoots, and they're just walking in to look at him. Now, that, I know it terrified him, but that would be kind of cool to see. Now, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? I'd love to see that. Thank you to the writer for sending this. I love this story. I appreciate it. This is a true story. All names have been changed. Place names and dates remain factual. The place... Main roads, the state highways, and large county roads make little concession to the northern Indiana prairie. They zip north, south, or east-west across the sun's sparkle land. On smaller local roads, you feel the contour of the terrain, the gentle swell and dip past innumerable kettle lakes, the drainage ditches, and the creeks that vein this country. You smell the lush, loamy soil, but above all, the ever-changing sky. This is a rich country, and people have lived here for thousands of years. At a creek rock bar, you may be surprised how easy it is to find Indian arrowheads and pieces of pottery. The archaic and woodland people settled here after the last glacier retreated 15,000 years ago. Glacial melts left behind moraines, lakes, and the lazy meandering Kankakee River Basin with its chaotic half-million-acre wet woodland known as the Great Kankakee Marsh. Around the time of Christ, the Miami and the Potawatomi Indians settled this area. The Manitou protected their dark forests. At night, the spirits of men hunted the spirits of animals. The Mylan demons dwelt under the earth. The first white men here were French voyagers intent on fur harvest. They left behind only place names like La Crosse, La Porte, and La Paz. Later, real settlers, American sodbusters, began the epic transformation of the Midwest wilderness into the agricultural heartland of the continent. The Potawatomi were driven out in the 1830s. The Grand Marsh resisted the plow for hundreds of years. Too wet to cultivate, too thick to navigate, the marsh and the woodlands sang with life. 
This was the largest inland wetland in North America. It was a paradise for waterfowl. Hunting flourished. Early railroads lay down short sidings as Hoosier guides pulled gentlemen hunters from Chicago into the swamp. A barrel anchored in the marsh grass allowed them to wait snug for the waterfowl. At the end of the day's shooting, the sportsman could repair to the luxury of the rail car sleeper. And so the slaughter began. Hunters shot away the deer and drove away the last of the eastern bison. Trappers cleaned out the beaver, mink, marten, and other fur bearers. Change accelerated in the 1880s when flat-bottom steam dredges bulled in and their iron jaws gnawed away at the Kankakee wetlands. The Grand Marsh, once so vast, was reduced to some pitiful holdings, and the land lay stripped. Now farmers could begin cultivating fields of corn and soybeans. Mint thrived in the rich, mucky soil. On muggy summer nights, the aroma drowned the land. These families built America. The food prices plummeted with the bounty grown in the Midwest Eden. Corn and pork from Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois fed America. Little towns thrived, built around the railroads and grain elevators. It was a good time, although a hard one. Getting your back into the work was an accepted part of life. And while the mechanization enabled the farms to grow, farm work was never done. It follows a seasonal rhythm of tillage, planting, and harvest. In winter, there were animals to tend to and equipment to repair. The Man Russell Schaefer was born here in 1901. Skyan of the region's old farm families, it was a big outfit, and Schaefer was a respected man in this community. While he was known as Russ to most, his family and close friends called him Boots. He was nicknamed as a toddler when he would climb into his daddy's waders and clomp about the farmyard. The Schaefer family had been on this land for generations and were known like their German forebearers for self-reliance, thrift, decency, and common sense. Russ's grandfather, Erwin Schaefer, had built the immense bank barn in 1880. Russell's father, Ivan, had taken over after his grandfather was gone, and now, with his passing, the farm belonged to Russ. Family was everything to the Schaefers, and Russ planned that one day his son, Rob, would take over for him. He and Jesse were thankful their girls, Kim and Marilyn, had married local men, and their grandkids were close. He kept a brown pony called Dot for them to ride. Saturday, August 27, 1960 Saturday dawned clear and cool. It was a golden late August day. Labor Day would be the following weekend, and Jessie Schaefer drove the pickup truck to Bass Lake to take her widowed sister some blueberries and sweet corn. Alice Bach traded with Jesse for garden greens, tomatoes, and peppers. They talked about children and grandchildren, and on her drive back home, Jesse gassed up at Coffin's Corner Market outside Knox and bought two salt blocks. A boy loaded them into the pickup truck's bed. Russell Schaefer spent the morning repairing a power takeoff unit and then repairing a drawbar and caring for his animals. It was a clear, warm day, and he was looking forward to sitting in the shade with a tall glass of lemonade before supper. Early that evening, Jessie Schaefer called her husband into their meal of chicken, mashed potatoes with gravy and green beans. There was coffee and freshly baked blueberry pie for dessert. Schaefer finished his pie and ice cream. He swigged the last bit of his coffee, folded his napkin, and pushed himself away from the table. It was dusk and the cool of the day had descended. It was a good time to be alive. He told Jesse that he was going to take the salt out to the Black Angus cattle herd. He would be back in time to help her wash dishes. 
Schaefer walked out to the truck parked under the trees and held the door as his dog Tarzan jumped in. He drove away from the house, and he was never seen again. The Search The Stark County Sheriff Department logged a call from a distraught Rob Schaefer at 11.15 that night. Schaefer reported finding his father's truck abandoned and was unable to locate his father on their large farm. His mother was frantic and insisted he call. Dispatch directed the deputy to the scene and then radioed the senior deputy, who having just broken up a dust-up at a dance at English Lake, had monitored the radio traffic and assigned himself to assist. On his drive out to the Schaefer farm, Deputy Sheriff William Rudd mentally cataloged what he recalled of Russell Schaefer. He was a churchgoer, probably in his late fifties, married with two, no, three adult children. Schaefer was of average height, five foot ten, he guessed. He was heavy set, not a smoker, probably not much of a drinker aside from an occasional beer at the American Legion or the VFW. Most of these farmers were like that. Did he wear glasses? Rudd thought so. Schaefer seemed like any other prosperous local farmer, plain, modest, perhaps even gruff, but truthful and honest. Not the impulsive type. You do what you can and you bear what you must. A needle in a stack of needles. Schaefer was renowned, if renowned was the right word for it around here, for having bought a new 1947 Indian motorcycle. People said it was the only foolish thing the man had ever done. Some might dismiss Bill Rudd as a Stark County hill rat, but that would be a mistake. Rudd had a keen inquiring mind. He was a veteran of the fierce world of death. He had served in a signal unit of the 45th Infantry Division during World War II, all the way from the landing at Salerno in Italy to Anzio Beachhead, and then the invasion in southern France. Finally, the 45th had clawed its way into Germany and liberated Dachau concentration camp. Rudd had seen and done things no man should have to see or do. He had seen every variety of horror in human frailty. As a deputy sheriff, he dealt with more mundane matters. Petty theft, drunks, fighting at a crossroad tavern, normal ruckuses. The deaths he dealt with now were car crashes and drownings and farm accidents. Murder in Stark County was rare. From time to time, one cheating spouse shot the other. But disappearances like this were exceedingly rare. Rudd was in fact a shrewd judge of character and a diligent deputy sheriff. It was a well-known fact, if unsaid, that Rudd ran the county law department while Sheriff Boom Miller cruised toward retirement. Rudd was accustomed to being underestimated and he used that to his advantage as deputy sheriff. Now, at midnight, he was speeding to the Schaefer farm on County Road 800 West. No one called it 800 West. To the locals, it was Schaefer Road. Rudd pulled into the long drive that bisected a field of wax beans. A mounted light fixture provided illumination. On his left was the Schaefer home, a handsome prairie dwelling. Somewhere inside, a dog was barking. On his right was an old bank barn probably built in the last century. Next to it was a modern pole structure with an attached machine shed with a large open lot sheltering an Alice Chambers tractor. Behind that, a stand of walnut trees and in front of that, a disused corn crib and freshly whitewashed hen house. Another open lot held a station wagon, and behind that grew a tangle of trees. He was on a dark farm track passing a cattle enclosure. Rudd could just see the Angus cattle bunched up defensively near the barn, and ahead were towering fields of corn. He concentrated on the rutted track, 
He had never been on this property before, though he had flown over it and had a fairly good idea of the layout. Dry weeds swished and crackled under the vehicle's weight. In the distance, Rudd could make out a sputtering red road flare, and he headed toward it. At the end of the path, he pulled up and found Deputy Richard Young. He opened his cruiser door. Bill, Young said. Rich, what have you got? He could see Young's cruiser parked a short distance away and near it a pickup truck. We got Russell Schaefer, Young answered flatly. Wife says he left the house at dusk to check his cattle. Didn't return. She called the son who found this. Young motioned toward the truck. Okay, Rudd answered. Let's start with that. They walked over to the truck. Is Rod Schaefer here? Young motioned toward the dark west. He's down there in the creek looking for his dad. Moonlight bathed the landscape in an unnatural cold brilliance. It was very quiet, oddly still, thought Rudd. August's crushing insect drone was strangely silent. They approached Schaefer's Ford truck parked uphill from the creek. The driver door was open. Rudd leaned in with his flashlight and the key was in the ignition. The state registration strapped to the sun visor, he could make out a Remington 870 in the small space behind the bench seat. On the floorboard, next to the shotgun, was an unopened box of buckshot. Rudd ducked back out of the truck. In the weeds, just below the truck's rocker panel, lay a dented flashlight. In the silvery moonlight, its plastic lens cover shone like an open eye. There was a muted air of menace about the whole scene. Rudd, Young, and the Schaefer boy moved out and apart and began their search. Deputies Rudd and Young swung their county-issued 9-volt flashlight slowly from side to side. They called out for Schaefer. Rob Schaefer carried a battered Coleman lantern. Dad, he implored, Dad! The lantern soon dimmed and then died. In his haste, Rob had forgotten to fuel it. He was frustrated. Somewhere in the dark to the northwest, an owl called. The quiet wind brought a whiff of something tangy and foul. The search party of three patrolled north, east, and then south until they ran up against the weed-choked creek bank. They found nothing. The dark land was too vast and the searchers too few. Rudd turned to Young. Any helpful thoughts here, Rich? Young shook his head. In the night, it was too dark to find anything. Moreover, they were trampling the scene. Rudd, as a senior deputy, decided to wait for dawn and a larger search party. They were accomplishing nothing here. There was a heaviness about the air. It was cold now. Young zipped his jacket tighter. Rudd felt an uneasy tingle of being watched. You could see everything in the moonlight, and yet you could see nothing. And he turned to Young. You ready to get out of here? Rudd asked Young to stay on the scene. Young was accustomed to that. It was standing operating procedure. He lit a cigarette as he watched Rudd's cruiser pull away. The next morning, Sheriff Miller, Deputy Rudd, and the county search and rescue volunteers returned shortly after first light to begin a systematic canvas of the area. For a Sunday morning, it was a respectable turnout. Seventeen men tumbled out of their four vehicles, some laughing, some grim, some stubbing out the last cigarettes before beginning their search. Miller handed Young breakfast in a bag with a plastic cup of coffee, and Rudd handed Young a roll of toilet paper. Young grinned. Uh, You're too late with that, he said. To himself, Rudd decided that Schaefer had had a stroke or a heart attack. Confused and disoriented, he had staggered off. He would be found in an adjacent field or the nearby creek. He might still be alive. Miller glumly agreed with his deputy, though neither wanted to say so to a heart-wracked Jesse Schaefer. Miller addressed the search and rescue volunteers and told them the purpose of the search 
and then Rudd split them up into teams and assigned search quadrants. They fanned out. It was a long morning, wading through the cornfields and searching by the creek. By noon, the sun was hot. Search and rescue had turned up nothing. After a fast lunch, the search area was extended to the opposite side of the creek. An hour into the expanded search, Blaine Smith yelled. Uphill from the creek, he'd found a pair of broken steel frame glasses. Rob Schaefer confirmed they belonged to his father, but nothing else was found. It was puzzling and frustrating. Rudd thought, sick people, injured people don't go uphill. It just doesn't happen. Rudd now doubted this was a medical emergency. The search continued, and buoyed by finding the glasses, optimism flared that Schaefer would be found. But that didn't happen. All the rest of that day, nothing more was found. Search and rescue scoured for another day, still nothing. Rudd shrugged it off and arranged for Boy Scout Troop 186 to join the search. It was as if Schaefer had vanished into a thin mist. By now, the Schaefer case was local and state news. Volunteers made sporadic searches. A week went by, and then another, and then a month passed, and the search was suspended. Hope faded and finally died. The Schaefer case became a curiosity, and then it was forgotten. It was now the second week of October. It's one hell of a thing, Bill. I've never had a stone-cold who done it. Boom Miller sat across the office desk from Rudd. Miller had been Stark County Sheriff for 19 years, though he had been a county lawman for many more. He had never had a missing person case like this before. From time to time, teen runaways might take off for a romp in Chicago. It was rare, but they always returned to shocked and disapproving parents. Miller told Rudd he could recall only one similar case. In LaPorte County during the war, a timber cruiser had been working north and west of Five Lakes and had utterly vanished. Miller didn't know if that case had ever been cleared. No, he told Rudd. They never found the guy. There's big woods up there. Well, there used to be. He and his brother ran a sawmill. Howes was the name. The lumberyard's still in the family. They dismissed the notion that Schaefer had been kidnapped. The circumstances didn't fit. Moreover, there had been no ransom contact. Schaefer was not the type to just take off. Miller quietly snorted. No, he wouldn't do that. It's not like we made a hash of this. We've just got no way forward, Bill. With the investigation at a standstill, it was time to inform the family that the official investigation had ended. Rudd volunteered to do that. He met Rod Schaefer for breakfast at Sissy's Cave in downtown Knox. Rob Schaefer took the news well. It was what he expected. There's just a few things, Rob, Rudd said. Did your dad always carry a gun in his truck? No, that's unusual for him, Rob sipped his coffee. But things have been happening that kind of spooked him. Rudd raised a quizzical eyebrow. Well, it was little things. Someone broke into the barn a couple of times. Dad didn't like that. At first, we thought it was just kids. He put up a locking bar and a Yale lock on it. That got broke. Tools came up missing. Stuff moved. The cattle were acting weird and other stuff. It wasn't just us. Talk to Bud Kreidler. He had some things going on as well. Anyway, Dad began taking precautions. Well, what about the dog? Rudd said. Tarzan? That dog accompanied Dad everywhere. That's what really scared my mother. She knew Dad had taken him along, so when he ran up on the porch, she knew something was wrong. That dog never begged to be let in. Never. Betty, the house dog, she was barking like crazy. Tarzan? Why'd you call him that? Rudd asked. Schaefer sighed. He had a funny bark when he was a pup. My sister Kim called him that. Rudd and Schaefer talked for a while. 
And soon, Bill Rudd was called to break up a dispute over a property line, and Rob Schaefer sat alone in the diner staring out the window. Oblivion How does a man disappear into oblivion? How can he leave his supper table, drive a short distance inside of the home he just left, and simply disappear? Schaefer saw or heard something. It was dusk, the August light was failing. What did he see? What did he hear? The man drives a half a mile down a beat-up farm track. He knows his path and the land surrounding it as well as he knows every pore in his wife's high cheekbones and her clean, sweet lips. This stoic has lived on this land longer than he has been married to his wife. In this land of grace, how is it that Russell Schaefer faced only retribution? How is it that he stepped into oblivion? Aftermath The Russell Schaefer case never cleared. Nothing more was found. For a few years, people remarked on it, and then, as is the way of all things, it was forgotten. It became a slim file in a three-drawer cabinet. Once or twice, someone would pull the file out and read through it. With nothing to add, it was put back. Boom Miller hung on and remained county sheriff until 1972. Bill Rudd got tired of waiting, got tired of police work, and got tired of a community where everyone knew everyone else's business. He began night courses at the local college and got his law degree, specializing in criminal law. He was hired by a legal firm in South Bend. There's always good work for a good criminal attorney in South Bend. Later, he was recruited by a larger firm in Indianapolis and practiced there until he retired in 1998. He and his wife, Doris, moved to Panama City, Florida. I interviewed him there a few years before he passed away in 2016. Rudd remembered the Schaefer case. It was a strange one. We never uncovered anything on that case, he said. We never cleared it. We never came close to clearing it. I always hoped that someday a body would be found, at least something, and if that didn't solve the mystery, at least it would provide some solace and some comfort to that family. People around there just don't disappear like that. You know, the Schaefer place fell apart after Russell disappeared. The son couldn't run it, and they eventually sold out to Con Agra. The fine house and all the outbuildings are gone. It's like the way of life disappeared with Schaefer. It's run as a factory farm now. Rudd paused. You know, we've seen things, Doris and I. We've been places. Our son met and married a Peruvian girl he met at Purdue. His father-in-law convinced Paul to move down there and do an inventory control on his fishing business in Lima. It's quite a wealthy family. We visit Paul, Marina, and our grandchildren down there. It's a beautiful country. Wonderful food, Lima, Calo, Machu Picchu. I've talked to the Peruvians we've met. Some of them are Amazon people. I told them about the Schaefer case, and they told me they have similar disappearances down there in the jungle. They blame it on sorcerers or even monsters. Some of them say, maybe the land took your man. Bill Rudd chuckled. Most of them have a lot of Indian blood, you know. They believe in some powerful juju. In Peru, there's still a lot of belief in magic and the supernatural. Rudd paused again. I don't know. Maybe it's as good an answer as any. This story was written for Blanche, Bernice, and Alice. The author is Gerald Gustafson, written in August 2021. Okay, here's another story I think you guys are going to get a kick out of. The writer says, my name is Denise and here is my story. My brother-in-law and his wife live in East Texas, out in what we affectionately call the boonies. I guess boondocks would be the technical term. They live in a farmhouse on top of a hill looking down into an open meadow with pine woods beyond that. It's beautiful and it's peaceful there. Well, it used to be. 
Last fall, my husband and I went to their home so my husband could help his brother with some carpentry work. This is not my forte, so I decided to take the mule. I think that's the term for a four-wheel type vehicle that you can haul stuff with. Although I think I would have preferred an actual mule because the mechanical one I rode was about as smooth as taking a spin in a washing machine. Not that I've ever done that. I took some trash bags so that I could gather pine needles to use in my chicken coop and garden. After an hour of bouncing up and down on that hard seat, I found a great spot to gather up some pine needles. It was at the back of their property where there are a lot of trees and a creek that zigzags back and forth across the property. It was a beautiful fall day. The only thing I was concerned about at this time was watching for snakes as I gathered the pine needles. And I loved listening to the birds sing as I went about my work. I had gathered a lot of pine needles and loaded them on the mule, and I was still wishing it was the four-legged kind of mule. I decided to walk for a little while before I bounced back to the house, thinking maybe I could somehow use one of the bags as a cushion. I had been walking for about a half an hour and had come to a washed-out area that made sandy high banks on each side. The banks were 15 feet tall. There were several rocks exposed from the creek flooding, I guess, and some of the rocks were really pretty, so I amused myself by digging around and looking for neat rocks. I had been doing this for a while when I noticed everything got real quiet. It was then that I heard a rustling coming from the top of one of the banks. I couldn't see anything from where I was, so I just froze waiting to see what was going to happen. And then I smelled it. It was horrible smell. It was the worst thing I've ever smelled in my life. It was a combination of cat poop, <laughs> smelly old mop water, and skunk that had been dead in the road for a while. And then the rustling stopped. I was getting nervous now, thinking it was a wild hog because I've heard they can be mean. I decided just to stay still and hope it would go away. Not that my legs would have worked right then anyway. And then I heard the oddest sound. It sounded like someone clucking like a chicken. It was comical and amusing, and I wondered what in the world was going on. A million things flashed through your mind. I began to think that I was going to be murdered by a mad clown that thinks he's a chicken. I leaned up against the bank and still hoping it would go away. And then a rifle shot rang out, and it sounded like a cannon, and it was followed by a big thud. And then I heard voices. There were men's voices talking. I was thinking that it was the hunters, and they had shot the hog. And one of them said, Damn good shot! You got that sorry devil! Steve, you're one crazy son of a gun. I can't believe that stupid chicken dance of yours still works. And then one said to get the head. And I heard a chopping noise, and a thud, and a thunk, and a thud, and something came rolling down the bank. And it was the head. It was a huge, ugly, hairy head, but it wasn't a hog. All I could do was stand there, frozen, thinking there really are Bigfoot creatures in these woods. No, it can't be. I must be having a stroke, I thought. I was jerked back to reality by someone saying, You go get it. You're the one that dropped it. Next thing I know, here comes a man scrambling down the bank with a burlap sack. In kind of a southern voice, he said, Excuse me, ma'am, I didn't mean to startle you, dear, but I really do need to get that head that I dropped. He came over and he shook my hand, introducing himself as Steve Lilly. He gave me his thanks and said they were sorry to have bothered me. He picked up the head and put it in the sack, and then he tipped his hat and he said, Well... Bye now, and he climbed back up the bank. And that's how I met Bigfoot and the hero named Steve Lilly that apparently saved me from a Bigfoot. Oh, that was a good story. I knew the Steve Lilly part was coming, but I love these Steve Lilly encounter stories. They're as good as Bigfoot stories. And by the way, I'm getting close on the Steve Lilly relaunch of the podcast. Hang tight. Quit asking. No, I'm just kidding. Y'all ask all you want. I think that's like the third most popular question in the comment section. Where's Steve Lilly? It's just that phrase. Where's Steve Lilly? Everybody wants to know where Steve Lilly is. 
He's coming. He's coming. I'm hoping by the middle of November, at the latest Thanksgiving, we'll have that podcast launched. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work launching a new podcast, but I really want to do this right. I kind of throw these videos together on Dixie Cryptid, and if you listen to um, the two audiobooks that I've recently uploaded, the uh, Odin's Call and Curse of the Wendigo, those are kind of as perfect. They're they're not professionally done, but they're as professional as I can do them. And I think they sound pretty good and they're done fairly well. I'm not a good narrator. I know that. But I love doing this and I had a lot of fun doing it. I tried really hard to narrate two good books. And that's what I'm trying to do with Steve Lilly. I'm trying to do a professional show, a real show. So it'll launch. There'll be 15 episodes. We've got 10 up. There'll be 15 episodes when it launches. So stand by. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, you guys, thanks for listening to this podcast, and we'll see you on the next one.